One of the images of Jesus that the Gospels present us with is that of healer. There is a fresco that was uh, painted probably sometime at the end of the 3rd century or 4th century, right at the beginnings of uh, the church when it came, uh, when it was acknowledged to be uh, legitimate within the Roman Empire. Uh, this was painted on the catacombs of St. Peter and St. Marcellinus in the Ophius room uh, in Rome. Jesus, the healer, transformed people's lives by, by touching them and by being touched. And there are many stories in the Bible that allude to the uh, healing process of touching. Jesus took Peter's mother-in-law by the hand and cured her of a debilitating fever. Jesus placed a mixture of saliva and dirt on a bland, blind man's eyes, and he regained his sight. Jesus touched lepers, restoring them in body, mind, spirit, relationships, and social positions. Jesus took hold of Peter's hand when Peter had jumped out of the boat a little too early and found himself sinking in the Sea of Galilee. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples demonstrating love and hospitality in the act of service. And Jesus had his own feet anointed by his friend Mary of Bethany just before his death. These and many other stories in the Gospels show that when people have an encounter with Jesus, the encounter often leads to restoration, uh, to new life, to healing. At the heart of our Christian story is this conviction, simply that God wants you and I and the people of this world to be whole. God wants all of creation, more than humankind, to be restored and redeemed and reborn into the fullness of what our potentials can be at the beginning of our lives. Two stories of healing are interwoven in today's Gospel lesson. It's another example of Mark's sandwich technique that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. First, Jesus begins by telling a story, interrupts it with another story, and then comes back like a sandwich to conclude the first story. First, we have the story of Jairus. Jairus is a synagogue leader, a man of prominence, and Jairus has a daughter who is critically ill. And then we have a story of a woman who has a debilitating health, uh, a, a problem of bleeding, and there is uh, little hope for her to be healed. She has lived with it so long. Jairus is a synagogue leader, the text says, the iris fell at his feet and begged Jesus repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she might be made well and live. The iris acknowledges that Jesus is one that God works through to bring healing. Jesus follows him home, but on the way to the home of Jairus, there is a poor sick woman who has spent all of her life savings on one doctor after another. Sound familiar for some of you? This woman came up behind Jesus in the crowd. She touched his cloak, hoping that this touch might make her well. Jesus stops, looks around, and simply by the woman touching Jesus' clothes, she receives healing. Because Jesus is detoured by this woman, by the time he gets to Jairus' home, the little girl is asleep, and the people standing outside are weeping for his death, for, for her death. And Jesus says to the crowd, she's just sleeping. Jesus takes the little girl's hand and says, it's one of the few Aramaic, past Aramaic phrases that we have in the whole of the, all of the Bible, Talitha Kum, which simply means, little girl, get up. 
And she does just that. And the people then are told by Jesus, go and get something to eat. The nearer that a crisis is to us, the stronger the desire to cry out to Jesus to be touched. To experience the healing touch and the person of Jesus. The people of Charleston, South Carolina, and the families of the nine victims who were murdered uh, two weeks ago now, or with last Wednesday, while attending Bible study at Mother Emmanuel, need, needed to feel some touch. Some touch by loved ones, by church members, from the wider society that we live in. The touch that says, this is not okay. That regardless of our color, we care about you and your loss. And we will work to ensure that this does not happen again in our communities. It's part of our human nature and our condition to ask, why do people suffer? Why do 20-year-olds get brain cancer? and eight year, years later die. I'm sure Robbie's family have been asking that over the course of these years after his diagnosis. We certainly know from experience that not all who pray and reach out to God are healed. And so these healing stories bring questions to, our, uh, to ourself and our spirit and cause us to be a little confused about the way that God works in the world or if God works in the world. But we know that life isn't like that. Everyone that Jesus healed and restored to life be eventually became sick and died. A woman who, whose hemorrhage was stopped after 12 years still lived as a poor peasant woman without any knowledge of where and how she was going to get fed because she lived in a in a, in a dominated empire with little hope of going up the ladder. These stories may reveal God's hope about improving the quality of life, stopping a hemorrhaging woman or reversing the untimely death of a child, but the meaning of these stories is so much deeper that if we just focus on them, on the miracle or the healing itself, we haven't understood gospel. Sickness and natural disasters and tragedies and violence and murder take us to a place of need. It is when we go to these places that we actually understand our need for healing. In these dark places, we know our vulnerabilities, our weakness, how much we depend on another person, our companion in life, our parents, our siblings, our circle of friends, our church. We know our inability to restore ourselves. It is exactly in this place that we become Christ for one another. It is in this place when we are at our most vulnerable, when we cry out for healing, that we become Christ for one another. Confronting a feverish grandchild, praying for a friend who is fighting cancer, Sharing a loaf of bread or a plate of chocolate chip cookies with a grieving family. Listening to someone who walks into our church who is in crisis. This is holy work. This is healing work. And these encounters, these acts of healing and service are woven with the energy of the Spirit 
and will be the hands and the feet and the touch of Christ that will bring health and restoration to one who is hurting, relief from pain, as well as, ener as, well as new energy, physical, emotional, and spiritual healing. Our God is a lover of life. God is always seeking the healing that brings peace and well-being being to ourselves and our world. As we have ourselves encountered the love and the healing and the salvation of Jesus Christ, Christ then uses us to be his hands and his feet and his heart to touch those to bring wholeness and healing to those in need. This is the work of ministry. This is the work of healing. We invite you to come and become a part of this community that seeks not only to be involved in mission and outreach and feeding the hungry, but to be there for each other, to be healing and wholeness for each other when we are in need.